Thank you, Rob. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Quick. South B, of course, who is indeed um, a volcano, was it? Oh, no, just a force of nature, but whether it's an earthquake or volcano, you know when you meet her that your life is being changed. I want to turn for a moment to 26, 27 years ago. We're celebrating a quarter century, but this is Armenian time, so it's really more than 26 or 27 years ago, to a different time, and I want you to remember those days. They were difficult, they were euphoric, they were a time of promise, of democracy, a return, it was said, to the path of civilization and an end of history. There would be the universal establishment of Western-style liberal governments and societies. They would look a lot like the United States or Great Britain, but they would also have all of the welfare benefits of Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And Armenia, it was believed, would be Singapore or Hong Kong, democratic, capitalist, and prosperous. Well, it didn't quite happen that way, Nipoluchilis, as they say in Russian. That optimism soon met reality. The manipulation of democratic practices within former Soviet republics, the rise of obscenely wealthy uh, oligarchs closely tied to and influencing or competing with government leaders, the collapse of the economy, the impoverishment of the majority of the people, the blockade of Armenia by Azerbaijan and Turkey, the emigration of hundreds of thousands of Armenian citizens to Los Angeles and other warm places. Pax Sovieticus, which regulated and repressed the more vicious features of inter-ethnic and civil conflict, disintegrated in a cascade of civil and ethnic wars in Karabakh, Transnistria, Georgia, Chechnya, Tajikistan, and elsewhere. And that former Soviet Russian mediator became in some places, once again, the brutal conqueror of its own internal periphery. Some countries did succeed in building democratic societies, market economies, let's say in the Baltic republics, in Poland, in Hungary, and Czechoslovakia most notably. Others witnessed the reestablishment of the old communist nomenklatura in Azerbaijan, in Central Asia in particular. Nationalist oppositions came to power in other places, as in Armenia, in Georgia, and uh, in, in, um, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. So there were bright spots. They appeared. But the shadows over time grew longer. Well, in the West, political scientists tried to figure out what was happening. They thought theoretically and practically about these changes, these transitions to democracy or, or toward authoritarianism. And they came up with various paradigms or ways of framing this understanding. The first one I remember was sort of during the Cold War, so before the end of the Soviet Union, from indeed the late 1940s through the 1970s, there was a time when Political scientists thought if we only get the architecture right, if we set up parliamentary or presidential systems with the right guarantees, if we do something like the Westminster model, then those countries which were emerging from colonialism, as in Africa and Asia, would eventually end up like the West. Now, all of this idea of getting the architecture right was in the framework of the dominant paradigm of the Cold War, the modernization model. In that model, you could avoid uh, poverty if you could get a prosperous country, if you could move toward democracy, and there was a kind of magical connection between the idea of capitalism and democracy. Freedom, prosperity, all of that would go together, and over time, societies and governments would move toward the United States. They would look like Britain or the United States. Well, that didn't work out so well. Military regimes took over many of those countries. The mo this idea of getting the architecture right, that institutions alone could do it, seemed to fail. So political scientists went back to the drawing board. They had to work hard because they wanted tenure in universities. And they came up with an idea 
that, you know, in order to make a democracy, you had to have prerequisites. You had to have certain things already there. Maybe a high level of material prosperity. Maybe a bourgeoisie, that's a fancy Marxist word, for a middle class. And maybe, indeed, traditions of tolerance and uh, faith in such institutions. So this prerequisites model, which held that the only way to make a democracy was to fulfill what they called the social correlatives of democracy, became the dominant understanding of how we would do it. Economic development was necessary. Civil society that looked a lot like the developed West. An entrepreneurial middle class, a culture of tolerance. In such an ambitious scenario, some despaired that the only places that could succeed to make a democracy like that were like Sweden or Norway or places that already had something that looked a lot like democracy. Well, this was a very optimistic view, but then, of course, it meant there'd be no revolutions, no real great social conflicts, and eventually the groups in society would come together either ethnically, multi-ethnically, multiculturally, or across class lines. Some theorists even went further and said that the really sufficient, and not, and not necessary, but not sufficient condition for democracy was capitalism itself. Well, those values are very valuable, and if you can get them, of course, it might help in that tradition. But indeed, most countries that were moving toward democracy or toward, away from the old dictatorships or colonial regimes did not have these features. And nagging us from the left were those dependency theorists who questioned the benefits of a Western-inspired and directed modernization program that led not to autonomy and independence, but to subordination to the metropoles, New York, Washington, London, of the Northern Hemisphere. So a new paradigm arose. It, it, you didn't have to have all those uh, prerequisites now. In this new paradigm that Rob mentioned, transitology, you didn't have to have the ingredients or even the uh, institutions. You had to get the process right. The movement from authoritarianism to democracy was important. So here again, no revolution, no taking property away from the bourgeoisie, but in this new orthodoxy, this transitology, what you needed was patience and a pact, an agreement between those old elites who were giving up power and the new elites who were coming into power. You could not, you could not checkmate the king. You could not steal his property. You had to give guarantees to the old elites that they would still survive, even do well, but the new elites would come in. This transitology paradigm, instead of the structuralist limitations of the preconditionalists, they emphasized and said, not structures, not environments, but agency, actors, elites, who would try rationally to maximize their interests and gains during these transitions. So rather than Karl Marx, they were attracted by the Chicago School of Economics. You didn't have to believe in democracy even. That wasn't so important. What was important was that the elites, those in power, those coming to power, benefited from playing the game of democracy. The crucial thing in transitology was whether democratic regimes would generate incentives that would encourage political groups uh, that lose to, to stay within the democratic framework so that they might in the future play again rather than try to overturn the whole game. Democracy, everyone warned, actually operates and occurs in conditions of uncertainty. So you needed that transition, in that transition, an agreement, a pact between the ruling elite and the moderate uh, opponents of that elite. Interestingly enough, in Armenia, you actually had something like that. In many places in the world, uh, you, like say in Georgia uh, and elsewhere, you didn't have it, 
And indeed, the new elites and old elites would go into conflict. Indeed, in Georgia, you had a civil war. In Tajikistan, you had a civil war. In other countries, you just had the old communists stay in power. But in Armenia, the communists gave way relatively easily. Oh, they tried once in 1988 and 1989 to rule without the nation, but they had to give in to the Hehesher, to the Armenian national movement, and they, they sort of slipped off the stage, and Ter Petrosyan came to power. So there was a pact originally, and Armenia, along with Kyrgyzstan, was among the most democratic states to emerge from the fall of the Soviet Union. But there were other problems. Those transitions to democracy through this pacting, which were so successful in Spain and Portugal, in much of Latin America, came up against new problems in the post-Soviet world. Because in the post-Soviet world, you were not just moving elites, political elites. Those Latin American countries were capitalists. They were authoritarian, but they were capitalists. They had market economies. You didn't have that here in this part of the world. What you had instead were state economies that had to now be recreated as market economies with new middle-class entrepreneurs in power. So you had both a simultaneous political and economic revolution that was about to take place. The whole class structure would have to be changed. A very difficult thing to do. It might have succeeded gradually if things had held firm. But instead, many of these countries, with the fall of, of Gorbachev and the end of Perestroika, moved not from slow reform, but to radical revolution, the disenfranchisement of the old elite and conflicts that developed, as in Russia in 1993, where Yeltsin himself carried out a coup d'etat against his own parliament. So these communist regimes went their own way. These countries developed in different ways. And indeed, the promise of democracy began to fail. So what was the problem? Was it indeed that there was no pact? We had a pact here. Was it indeed that there were no preconditions? Well, there weren't so many. But in fact, that seemed to work in some places, even where there is no no, uh, uh, there is no preconditions. What were the special conditions of this part of the world that made it so difficult for so many of these countries to move in a democratic direction? First of all, most of the states of the former Soviet Union were kind of proto-states. They had never had real sovereignty. They had elites, old communist elites in power, but one of the great achievements of communism was that they, they rejected, they monopolized all their power and rejected the creation or permitted the creation of alternative elites. So most countries didn't have alternatives. Armenia did because it had a nationalist movement down below. Secondly, all these republics had to deal with the problem that there might be a state, but were there really well-formed nations within that state? How coherent? And conscious was Kazakhstan as a nation? Was it just a facade republic? Or Tajikistan? Or Azerbaijan? Azerbaijan's own nationalism would be a reflection and a response to the Armenian struggle over Karabakh. Now, Armenia had that advantage. Armenia was one of the most nationally conscious uh, republics in the former Soviet Union. And it was one of the most, it was the most homogeneous ethnically. But still, in many of these countries, various clans, regional elites, dominated the economy and the political order. And that was also true in southern Caucasus, in what was called then Transcaucasia. But I want to emphasize some other factors that Rob Inglis already talked about. That is the commitment to democratic government and to capitalist development was loud, was rhetorical, but was often formal. And elites were willing to play fast and loose with human rights, elections, freedom of the media, and fair business practices. In Armenia, the democratic first elected president of this country, in fact, arrested the major figures in the major opposition, the Dashnak Sutyun. And it was only a move after that that we moved away in Armenia from democracy until that president himself was removed in what you might call a constitutional coup d'etat. Also, 
many of these transitions, which did not really eliminate the old former communist nomenclatura. Much of the state property went into the hands of former state managers. Communists and Komsomol leaders became the new bourgeoisie in a highly monopolistic economic system, and those powerfully wealthy people were, were influential enough to govern or to have their satraps in the government. And fifthly, and most sadly, in most of these places, the people themselves, ordinary people, were depoliticized effectively, disenfranchised. They became passive, disillusioned, angry, and saw little chance for change in the future. What's stunning up to me about Armenia is that even though the government may not be responsive, and many fear and are discontented with that government, civil society in Armenia is alive and well. People are unafraid even much more unafraid than in Russia, where I taught for two months uh, in the fall last year. And so this is a very odd situation in this country, where you have indeed a, a government less responsive, and yet a civil society ready to criticize, discuss, hold conferences as we do today. Now I have a confession to make. I worried about saying this in public, but I think one has to be honest. A quarter century ago, I worried greatly about the effort by enthusiastic Armenians to create an independent state and break up the Soviet Union. I knew, as a Sovietologist, that the USSR was a rather odd kind of empire, a very unusual one. An ideological state, of course, that refused to recognize that it was an empire. It was a self-denying empire. All sovereignty, of course, remained in Moscow. But that communist system, for better or for worse, made colossal efforts to develop the peripheries of the empire, the non-Russian republics. The Soviets transformed their country. They industrialized a peasant society. They created beautiful capital cities for each republic, including Yerevan. They built an immense infrastructure that included metros in all the Union capitals, can you imagine Moscow building us a metro today? But ultimately, that system worked in the interest of the whole as decided by Moscow. Armenia developed into a modern state, but always under the restraints and constraints of the center. 20 years ago, in 1990, I was invited to talk at Yerevan State University. Now, we didn't know then that the communist era was nearing its end. We were one year before the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the independence of Armenia. Someone in the audience at the end of the talk asked me, what do you think of our independence movement? I was in a very odd position because I was actually opposed to the breakup of the Soviet Union and was hopeful at the time that the reforms initiated by Mikhail Gorbachev would result in a more democratic, socialist federation of equal, autonomous republics. In other words, that the system would be different from the centralized Soviet economy of Brezhnev, which was then in collapse, but would not imitate the market-centered, largely unregulated capitalism favored at that time, you remember, by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, what we now call neoliberalism. I was hopeful that what could emerge from the chaos of Perestroika would be a looser, more democratic federation of republics with greater self-rule, but within a single state. And I also feared that Armenia on its own, standing as it does for all eternity, next to hostile countries, Kemalist Turkey at the time, Azerbaijan, would be perpetually threatened by its neighbors. So my answer to that question was, Yanimagu predstavit Armenia bez Rasi. I cannot imagine Armenia without Russia. The audience, of course, was not happy with my answer. Well, we know now Nipaluchilis. It didn't quite work out the way I thought at the time. Russia itself moved quickly from the Gorbachev movement toward democracy step by step away. Let's not forget 
who actually created the system of a strong presidency in Russia that allowed the transition from a relatively alcoholic and sick Yeltsin to a relatively rigorous, sambo-fighting, bare-chested Putin. It was Yeltsin who created that system and handed that power over to Putin in the year 2000. Russia itself is the best example of a country where the leaders of that country decided that they would move toward non-democratic solutions, toward greater authoritarianism, to greater centralization, uh, because politics for them, as in the movie The Godfather, was not about winning and losing, negotiating and compromising, that's democracy, but winning at any cost and holding on to power without surrendering it. A logic of war, of destroying your enemies, rather than a democratic logic, replaced that politics, those politics in Russia. And the Russian example easily spread to other republics as well. You might have called Putin's government or any of those government, many of the governments in the former Soviet Union managed democracy. These are different terms that are used, sovereign democracy. I like the term facade democracy. It looks like a democracy, it walks like a democracy, but it ain't a democracy. Elected authoritarianism, hybrid authoritarianism, competitive authoritarianism, the list goes on and on. Political scientists have to make money as well. Putinism, Putinism is a kind of hybrid of constitutional forms that reflect democratic aspirations, but the actual practice is authoritarianism. It's a mix of both state capitalism and neoliberal reliance on markets, local and global. And that's the system that many of the republics indeed have followed. Now we know in this part of the world that there are always dangers around us that wars and the threats of wars are constant. We have also learned in the last 25 years that wars and the threats of wars, of frozen pieces even, are the enemies of democracy and the friends of authoritarianism and national chauvinism. The conflict in Karabakh in many ways may have unified Armenians, but it also helped to erode democracy in Armenian. Armenians, seem always in history to face a dangerous, unpredictable future, and the same is true today. What happens in Russia, in Turkey, Iran, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and even the United States has profound effects on Armenia. Beware of some false friends, I would say. The turn, particularly in Turkey and in Russia, away from Europe, away from democracy, toward authoritarianism, populism, and rabid nationalism, toward some vague and confused notions of Eurasianism, has dangerous consequences for Armenia. Since the Ukrainian crisis and the annexation of Crimea, Putin's Russia has become more nationalistic and has turned its face toward Asia. Since the war against the Kurds started by Erdogan and the failed coup last year, Turkey itself has moved far from Europe and much more looking eastward now. It has various forms of Eurasianism. Some of them are pro-Russian. Let's unite with Russia against the West. Others are pan-Turkic or Islamic. None of them are good for Armenia. So, almost 27 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, for better or worse, I still cannot imagine Armenia without Russia. But think about it. What imperial relationship do we have now between Russia and Armenia? It's not the same as in Soviet times. This small country living in this dangerous neighborhood, for better or for worse, requires protection and support from its giant neighbor from the north. Maybe those ties are indispensable. Maybe they are colonial and exploitative. Think of who controls energy in the country. But in many ways, the relationship of Armenia with today's Russia, in many ways, is far more colonial than those relationships were before 1991. The Soviets transformed Yerevan from a large village to a grand capital city. But while they restricted the freedom and sovereignty of Armenians, they turned Armenia 
into a viable nation state. Putin's Russia is not the Soviet Union. It's not a common state with us. It thinks of its own interests primarily, which can at many times be at odds with those of Armenia. So though I cannot imagine Armenia without Russia, I have to wonder and worry, what are those connections between Armenia and Armenians, Russia and Russians today? And what are we left with in this country except reliance on ourselves and on this crazy nationalism which seems to govern our mentalities? I'm going to end with a joke, but it's a rather dark joke, one that I remember at the end of the Soviet Union. A little boy worm, a worm, said to his daddy, Daddy, what's it like to live uh, in an apple? And the worm said, the father worm said, oh, living with an apple is so wonderful. It's juicy. It's crunchy. It's, it's like living in Michigan. He said, Daddy, what's it like to live in an orange? Oh, you know, he said, oh, my son, you don't know what living in, in an orange is like. That's California. Sunny, juicy. It's wonderful. He said, Daddy, then why do we live in shit? He said, son, there's such a thing as the homeland. Shonar Galachun.